Good day, folks. Hello, Steve. I guess it is a, a new Friday for us. This is a new meeting time. All right, let's see. Two minutes. And let's get the ritual sign in for everybody and We'll kick off here in a minute. Let's see, Marina, the floor is yours for our first one. Okay. Yeah, so I guess the but what I wanted to talk about here was just kind of finalizing some of these um, requirements and, and scenarios before we go too much further with any of the key management discussions to make sure that we're all on the same page about what the goals are here. Um, so what I linked here just is two PRs from a while ago, looking at um, at these scenarios. So I guess we can look at the, um, the threat model to start, just kind of what, what the goal of the attacker is, what we're trying to protect against. Um, and then we, I guess we could just talk about it and see if we can um, come to some kind of consensus here and maybe get these guys merged. Um, yeah, so this first one, um, I guess I can share the screen. To... All right, can people see that? Red? Yes. OK, cool. Um, so this just adds to the threat model so some goals of the attackers. Um, the first one is, and I guess you can interrupt me if people have questions, concerns, whatever, because it's pretty short. Um, trying to have a party install a malicious image under the attacker's control. So that's pretty straightforward, you know, in install malware or whatever. Trying to have a party install an outdated image, um, for example, one with known security vulnerabilities. Um, making think... images, oh, go ahead. Sorry, for this one, I had uh, <clears throat> some questions around how we define an outdated image. Um, and because uh, just because something is old doesn't necessarily mean it has security vulnerabilities. Um, I think this goal, if if it if it's an attacker goal, I think we should be more crisper about what what threat we're trying to protect against here. That's a really good point. Yeah, because I guess what we're really trying to protect against is an image that the signing party no longer wants to have signed, right? Not any old image. Um, yeah, I would definitely defer to the person doing the signing makes that decision as not us to come up with our own definition for this. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that, that definitely needs to be rephrased. So I'll, I'll make a note of that. Yeah. I mean, you just want to phrase it as you don't want to let them install a, a revoked image or an image with a revoked signature? Yeah, that might be a good way to say it. The revoked or like the rescinded where, you know, it was once signed, but now it's not. Yeah. So that's an interesting question. We haven't actually said that a registry could be set to not accept unsigned images or for that matter, revoked images. It's not to say a product couldn't do it, but in the past, like this is the line that we've been struggling with a little bit is what is the spec and, uh, and standard for notary V2 you know, experiences versus what is the product line? Um, and we struggled with this a bit. <clears throat> even on saying uh, tags can be locked. 
that that's not something that conceptually is in the spec. So I don't know, I, I, what does I it mean that, to stop somebody from pushing an image that's not signed? I think that it's more like pulling an image. And I think that the client can be configured to ignore Node v 2 and just ignore this warning that says, oh, you know, you're pulling something not signed. And I think, you know, we shouldn't encourage that, but it, it's definitely something that may happen in certain cases in like, you know, testing environments or whatever the case may be. But um, I think that within the bounds of Node v 2 we're saying, okay, you know, we're trying to verify the ones that are signed, I think. That, that's how I Differentiate would... signed versus unsigned. Mm -hmm. That makes um, sense. And I think you're, because once once you cross the line of signed and unsigned, you're you're saying I could, there's also a, a signature is revoked. So it, it, I think that's the question is on the push or on the pull. Yeah. Um, and maybe we should go, go a little bit into defining that, but basically like, you know, maybe notary v2 is for the images that are signed and kind of that's, you know, as like a scope of work. Um, and there's not much we can do about developers who don't want to sign their images, right? Because, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just up to the registry and until there's a, a something in a, in a distribution spec that says, you know, a registry has the, may have the ability to block uh, images from being pushed that are not signed, which I think is a great idea it, that I imagine many registries will implement that, but is that a part of the spec or is that, you know, the, the feature thing? That feels more like a registry feature and I'm wondering what workflow risks that would encounter because you're always going to push an unsigned image to start with and then push the signature after that's out there. And so just working through mentally what the registry would have to do with that. But I feel like that's getting out of the scope of what we're trying to do here. I think you're muted. Yeah, I've got the toggle here. So, um, so I was when I was playing with the, uh, the references API a couple weeks ago, I was trying to simulate the scenario you were asking about with the, you know, the whole tag update thing. And there was some interesting pieces in there. Um, Okay, let, let's move on for the sake of, uh, I think we got it. Oh yeah, I think we know what needs to be done there. Um, making images unavailable. Oh, sorry, Marina, okay. before, you, before you go forward, I think when you said you were going to rewrite the number two scenario, like that line, you were talking about rewriting and, and adding information about signing on it. Oh, no, so it was kind of two different things. So I think to rewrite this one to say, um, trying to have a party install an image without a currently valid signature or something to those to that effect. And then we also kind of got into a discussion about, you know, the fact of, you know, what's in and out of scope of Node v 2 which I think maybe is a separate, you know, sentence that needs to be written somewhere here, which is like, you know, this is what specifically is in scope. Okay, so, be, so I, mean, I think like there are two things, right? Like there's the vulnerability part of it, the security vulnerability. And mm -hmm. I believe that is like the one of the objectives of the attacker and another different one is the signatures if it is signed or not but i don't think that does that make sense to talk about the signatures on the attacker goals um maybe because i feel like that's like a means to the goal to a certain extent um but it definitely you know it needs to be written somewhere um so we can figure that out okay cool Miranda, just one clarification because I'm reading it and it says install, like I'm installing the image in a cluster. Did I just hear you wrong? I, I had the impression that some of the way we were just discussing this was putting it into the registry as opposed to trying to actually pull it from the registry and do something. Like these make sense from a sense of I'm trying to run it on a node. Yeah, and maybe the word, maybe a better word than install is like verify, like you know, um, do the node v two verification despite the fact that these things, you know, don't happen, which which may then lead to an installation, but it's more like, um, but that's the step way that they're really attacking. What's interesting by saying it it happens upon verification is then the Brendan's point of like if this is a registry feature, a registry might verify things on push. So yeah. it, you, by, by saying it that way, you're not making a state of whether it's going to a node or going into a registry. You're saying the notary verify option should enforce these capabilities. 
I think so. Yeah, because I mean, if if the registry can prevent malicious images from, for example, this first case from being on the registry in the first place, um, and they choose to do so, I, th I think that would actually be a win, right? Because then, um, you know, there's less chance of people pulling those. Yeah, but at the same time, a lot of what we're doing here is assuming that the registry has been compromised. And so yeah, I, I don't want to depend on that. You know, that's a nice added feature, but I just don't want to depend on that. Yeah, so maybe like, so when the downloader verifies the image, these things happen? Was that the moment that we want this to be? Well, I think the, um, we're, we're calling this out as a, um, it's def it's mandatory whenever the deployer is pulling the artifact, right? And I think it's optional when the registry does it. Um, it would be a good practice for a registry to do it, but it, it's it's not one, it, that's a separate conversation, right? Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of, I think what, yeah, I was referring to by verification, which is not like the registry can do it in lieu of the user, but they could maybe also, um, you know, add some extra checks. All right, um, so number three, making images unavailable for installation, kind of a denial of service type attack or hiding images or something like that. Um, I'll give it a minute. And then uh, number four is preventing a party from learning about updates to currently installed images. This would be more um, a lot more for that tag update scenario um, specifically. Um, because if you're pulling by digest, obviously you wouldn't learn about an update. Um, so number five, convincing a party to download large amounts of data that interfere with the party system. This would just be basically another kind of um, malicious upload that would then cause this kind of thing. And number six, enabling future attacks of the above types to be carried out more easily. Um, my screen is covered. For example, by causing a party to trust and attack this key. Milan here. I had a quick question about the point for prevent a party from learning about updates. Uh, why would why should new new updates with just include new digest? So I push something, created a new digest, and not updated the tag. Uh, shouldn't clients also be able to see that as a as an update available? Is it required yeah. to always update tags? I think um, from, from what we've talked about in the past, and people can go ahead and correct me, that um, this would mostly apply if, if you update the tag to point to a new image. Um, I guess it, we'd also wouldn't want them to be um, unable to learn about a new digest that's pushed to the registry. But um, I think specifically mm -hmm. the concern is that, you know, if, if a tag was once signed in association with a digest, an attacker could just continue replaying that forever and never show new associations. If, if those tags are being updated. We're really hiding anything on the registry would probably be a good thing to avoid. So we could we could even expand that. Okay. It's a good goal. I just wonder if it makes sense for us to put uh, the full denial of service prevention in here because I don't think we're gonna be able to do that with notary. That's getting a little bit bigger of a scope. Yeah, I guess if you can't control the network, I think it yeah. would probably be maybe pretty feasible. And maybe this um, this third one maybe should be a little more, more fine grained for that as too. As I was reading it just now, I kind of realized, um, yeah, unless we control the whole network, that might be a little bit tricky. Brandon, were you touching on five or was that jumping ahead? I, I was kind of going into a, a bit of three and a bit of uh, not so much five, but more just um, Three and four, mostly. Maybe we'll, I, I might specifically call that out as out of scope. Um, that might be a good thing to add, like a little out of scope section. It includes that and the unsigned images. It yeah, sounds like I mean, it's, it's definitely someone's going to want to work on their side, but denial of service tax are a little bit beyond, I think, yeah. some of the stuff we're getting into. Mm -hmm. It just, I, I know it's jumping ahead to five, but it, like registries by definition store large amounts of data. And we've all seen these ML images with multi gigabytes of data. So uh, I'm not, I don't know how Notary would get involved with that on number five. So I just, 
yes, we should figure out how to solve that. And that's how we implement throttling and there's other things that we do, but I'm not sure how five is a notary goal. It might not be. There's the um, slow retrieval attacks, which um, have been used as attacks on update systems, but they get, I, they're kind of less common. And it really is kind of on the on the border of denial of service, which again is probably out of scope. So I, I would definitely see the argument for leaving that to the registry. So yeah. if, if it's a problem have we have five, to solve, I just don't think it's a notary problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if we're going to have five, it might make sense to scope that down to checking the manifest and the individual signature and not all the other blobs that might come along. Yeah, or maybe it can just be scoped to make sure that you're downloading the correct amount of data, even if it is large, like, you know, this is the size of the thing you should be downloading, that kind of thing. I think actually that's kind of interesting, but because we're talking specifically around the notary client, the notary client will know the approximate range of a signature. Like, I don't know what, whether we're in a K or 2K or whatever, but it, it's not going to be multi-megabyte. So that, that is an interesting mm -hmm. checksum that you can do. Yeah, I think it's basically, it's just, yeah, I think adding that little bit of protection. And also if you're signing a, a hash, you can um, sign the size of the unexpanded hash and then you'll know, you know, when you're, when you're pulling too much. All right, so yeah, I'll still on down for sure though. Uh, it's still not clear to me why that is a uh, notary requirement, though. That should just be your standard getting an artifact requirement, right? Like, why, why is this something that we would need to address from a, a signing perspective? I guess it's just, I, I mean, I, I could I could go either way on this one, but I think that my my thought here was that it, this is a kind of an opportunity to include those, those size requirements because we have... Um, is kind of signed and verifiable information. And then if we assume, you know, an untrusted registry, and if the registry is giving us those sizes, then, you know, that they maybe couldn't be trusted as much. Um, that's the thought here. Yeah, I'm just thinking to the OCI discussions that have been happening lately on adding the data field and figuring out how big a manifest can get has been a very contentious discussion over there. And so <laughs> it, it does make sense at a certain level. We just need to be careful to scope this so it doesn't include all the blobs and other things and making sure we're not stepping on those CI questions that are going on on another side. What's interesting about this one though, and I'm still not sure we need to put any denial of service stuff in here. So it's kind of like, if you get past step one, you know, uh, do we even want to cover any of the the, the, the size DOS kind of challenges? Mm -hmm. Then all we think we're seeing here is in a notary scenario, the content of the blob should no, should never be a certain beyond a certain size. The problem we're having the OCI call is those manifests are used for everything. So there's no way to make a determination specifically so uh, your, your point is right, like that, that size constraint is a problem, but that's because they're generic. Here, we're trying to make a statement that, and it's still not the manifest, right? We're, we're still talking about the blob itself. Well, I actually was thinking about both because in it, once you get the manifest itself downloaded, and if that includes a size, you can then use that to make sure that if you're downloading a, you know, a two megabyte image versus a two gigabyte image, you know that difference and you know how much you should be downloading. I'm thinking that's going to be outside of our scope just because that should be part of the image pull process that knows, okay, I've got a manifest that tells me I'm pulling these things and it should know at that point. And so we're, we're just saying this manifest is good or bad. And then once the pulling client knows that, it's up to it to verify the layers and everything that's pulling down. Yeah, and I guess if the, if the um, what's it called? The digest is signed, then that's pretty much the, you, you're already... The, the size is included in that. Yes. But the question is, if this, if you're getting the size information from an untrusted source, um, does that actually provide you this protection? So the size is in the manifest as part of the descriptor. Okay, and yes. then we're so signing the manifest. We are signing it. So then therefore we are providing this protection. I guess that, that would be my argument. <laughs> yeah, the, the point I want to be careful of is that we're not saying that notary is going to protect the client from a malicious registry that start shoving down two gigs of data in a blob that's only sized for three megs. And so well, that, that I think is going to be- Well, couldn't the after the size that they expect? 
So it's not notary doing the download though. That's that's where I'm trying to draw the line there. So notary Got will it. tell you the manifest is good or bad, but it's up to container D or something else that's doing the actual pull of the blob to know that it should stop pulling at that point. So maybe notary gives you the information you would need to not download excessive amounts of information. Yeah. Without notary actually. is going to tell you the manifest is good. Say, yeah. Like think of notary as a gatekeeper. So it's just a matter of, and there already are validation checks on the digest. Like I, I was actually with you for a second there because basically the signature does have, we're assigning the digest, which has the size in it. So yes, you could actually look at the signature and know that it's on the content. The, actually, no, I take that back. We, we sign the manifest. The manifest has the size of the manifest. The manifest, you have to look into the layers, layers or globs, and decide which size. So yeah, it, well, I think that's a design question. I think we could choose to include the size in our in our notary signature requirements. The size think, of all layers combined, and maybe maybe that's because of the layer situation. It, it's trickier, but yeah, maybe I guess I would say all layers combined. But we can, and again, this isn't like my my number one here here, but I think we should at least look at it and. <laughs> And That's decide. Right. It's, a, it's a gnarly one, I think, is what we're getting at. And, yeah. and to be fair, the the general digest descript, sorry, the descriptor already has this in it. So in theory, this checks, these checks are already being done. Um, and because it's done after notary would have been handed off to whoever, you know, whatever is running the thing, container D or whatever, then you're kind of out of the notary scope. And you, it's just the container D client by definition should be validating descriptors before pulling. Um, I'm still struggling to see why that should be a code signing requirement though. Like this sounds like this is a manifest and a container requirement where we can say whatever is in the manifest, like whenever you're pulling, you can you know validate size. If there's other fields that come up, those, those also get validated. And I think it's a question for the manifest in terms of what is required versus what is optional, right? Signing the manifest is just saying, that the manifest hasn't been altered. And I think that's the only part that should be in scope for notary. Yeah, okay, so maybe we should push page. this to, to an OCI discussion. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll create an out of scope section and everyone here can feel free to comment on that and we can make sure we're on the same page there. <laughs> I have a question on the number six, uh, specifically the, for example, causing a party to trust the attacker's key. Uh, just clarifying what is in scope of the system versus not. Uh, so with the whole key management and any key update or trust store update to be part of the solution or is in scope of the solution. As in this, this may also be something that based on how this is implemented is something that is set up by a policy external to the system. The, the set of keys or roots I trust. Might be a better question for when we jump to part two of the meeting when we have Niaz talking about the key management. All right, sounds good. Yeah, because I think my, my assumption here is that key management is a, is a part of the, the threat model, so as a part of these attacker goals. Um, yeah. All right, everyone happy? I'll, I'll make some updates to this and um, maybe folks can comment and we can try and get this um, put together in the next week or so. And, and I just had, I'll add the same comment on uh, artifact instead of image because we still want to secure Helm charts. Oh yeah, I think I first read, well. wrote this before some yeah. of the other documentation, so yeah. <laughs> uh, if that's it, then we as yeah. Did we also want to talk about the attack scenarios, uh, scenario oh, seven right. and eight? Yes. Sorry, Marina, you had two on the topic on your line. Yeah, that, that's right. Let me get that one shared. Um, OK, this just adds two quick scenarios to the the list. I think we're gonna, depending on who, who merges first, I think we're going to have to update these numbers. Um, but um, 
So the first one is a mirror is compromised. Um, just the idea that it's not just you know the, the initial registry itself that might be an issue, but if any if, any, if there's any mirror that's just copying all the data directly, um, we want to make sure that's not a source of attack. Um, and this next one is a I guess we're calling it machine in the middle attack. Um, and this is I think actually kind of I guess it's not related to the, the denial of service, but it's just that someone is is watching the network traffic and maybe saving stuff in the network traffic um and making sure they can't do like a replay attack or any of those other ones that we've talked about that whole mirror should not have permission to edit packages and signatures seems i mean they should not be able to do it undetectedly would be maybe oh yeah that, that's the point that, yeah, they, they technically can, but we should be able to detect it. What I'd want to look at is we might need to define a difference between a mirror and a copy of an image because people make copy images from, say, Acme copying to Wabbit or vice versa, and they add their own local information on top of it saying, okay, we've ingested this, now it's trusted by us. They add their own signatures or own details on it. That's separate yeah, that's... from upstream. And so that's a copy is not really a mirror in that case from I think the definition we're looking at here. Yeah, I think the idea here is more like mirroring the whole registry and that maybe should be defined somewhere. So yeah, I agree. There's also a couple of references to keys being stored in the mirror or in the registry. And I thought we were said we were saying the registry would not store keys. Um. We've talked about maybe having pointers or something that says where you get the keys, but we specifically wanted to say a registry was not going to get into the ownership of the key itself, even the public key. Yeah, it might be just a bit of, um, in, you know, inexact writing. It's more like access any um, any of those pointers to keys or kind of alter those key, those pointers to keys to then, you know, be able to, to perform an attack. Um, I need more definition on the key management scenarios to. Yeah, I think this. maybe as we clarify that, we can clarify this and um, figure out exactly what the scope is. All right, no other comments. Um, feel free to also comment in the in the PR and I'll I'll get those things updated. I think that's what I had. I think we have some key management discussion next. Yeah, zero. All right, let me get my screen share going. So um, I expanded the uh, pull request that is currently open um, and expanded the uh, uh, section covering um, requirements that needed further discussion. Uh, the remaining areas of the doc um, had um, some prior comments that haven't been addressed yet. So uh, I'm going to skip over those sections for now. Do you want to share so we can follow along? Yeah, I'm yeah. working on doing that. <laughs> This is, there we go. Okay. Um, is the, is my screen showing up? Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to go through five different areas and I'll pause for each one. Um, right now, I'm, we've, I've focused on um, adding in the, um, the scope of each one of these areas and what's being uh, detailed out. So we want to capture any areas that need to get flushed out uh, and questions here uh, and try and come back and answer them next week so we can uh, have a, a, 
a more in-depth discussion on uh, what the guidance on notary here is going to be. So the first area um, is the signing key expiry. Um, right now, whenever the signing key is being generated, um, you have a higher key in the hierarchy certifying it. And that certification has a valid validity period to designate how long the signing key can be used for. Um, so here we're going to, in this section, we'll discuss sort of the trade-offs between the setting expiry times and, and enforcing key rotation behavior uh, and what those need to be. Um, so this will discuss trade-offs between having like short-lived keys, uh, having um, uh, longer-lived keys and what the trade-offs there are uh, and whether we need to have any restrictions here. I'll pause here for a sec. Any questions on signing key expiring? Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to ask something that uh, we, we discussed here in, in Ericsson earlier. Uh, do you think we, uh, we are able to, for example, if we have a, our own uh, signing uh, service, kind of an internal uh, within the company, uh, do you think we, we might be able to uh, kind of a, a offload the signing operation into our own own uh, si uh, external signing uh, server or s service and then then use uh, notary for for pushing and, and key distribution it, it, do you think it, it would be possible into future or is it part of the the uh, any do we have any use cases for those ones anywhere? I think the scope for notary is, is, is different in the sense that the scope for notary is defining how artifacts are being signed and distributed, um, not necessarily how the keys themselves uh, are being managed. The, the specifications here for the keys will describe how the keys need to be configured externally and how they pertain to validation. But you could use uh, any key management service with those APIs to kind of make that work, right? I think that's the that's the design goal that we have. Oh, ah, okay. So, so that's yeah. what I like to hear. <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of feedback of, I've got a key management system, I wanna work with it. How do I? Can notary support that? And, and that is a key goal of ours. That's part of why I was also poking on a little bit of, we don't want to store any keys in the registry either is um, it, it's how do we store the reference uh, signatures and distribute them. And then we'll have a solution out of the box. But if a, a customer, a vendor, a cloud has a key management system that they're using, the customer shouldn't be locked out of doing that. Okay, yeah, that, that's really good. Um, I, think, I, sorry, I think in the sign key expert section there, you can also have a first sentence that defines the hierarchy. Because I think I know how to interpret that, but there's more than one way that I could, I think. And so, like, what does it mean? What, 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 what do you talk about with a hierarchy in the hierarchy? specifically. So if the first sentence were to define a hierarchy, I think that might help. Uh, that's a good call out. We'll expand the section. Um, we haven't, I think, defined the key hierarchy in the rest of the doc. Um, let's see. Uh... We have a brief definition earlier above. I'll, I'll kind of point to that in, in, in the key expiry to kind of make it clear what the hierarchy looks like. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the next point we had was uh, an, having support for an external timestamp server. Um, Timestamping authorities, We have there's a standard uh, RFC 3161 specification uh, that we have public timestamp uh, authorities uh, that are running right now. Um, this scenario is going to discuss adding support for it, what the benefits there are. Um, there are some pros and cons in making this a requirement. Um, it is a free service, but it is also a service that's managed by an external entity. Um, so it adds in a uh, dependency. So uh, this section, we're going to kind of carve out 
whether we support timestamp servers uh, and external term temp servers. And, and as part of that, is that like a mandatory requirement or is that an optional requirement uh, and what the behavior would be in either of those scenarios? Yeah, I think that um, this is definitely good to talk about because I think that regardless of what we decide here, we're gonna need some notion of timeliness for things like revocation and um, the rescinding of signatures. So I think that, yeah, we, could, we can talk about this and maybe it makes more sense for there to be something run by the registries or maybe it makes sense for, the, for like there to be some kind of service that um, people can run specifically for notary. But I think this is definitely something that we should discuss. Yeah, my own impression is that I think we want to have this as something that the client, the verifier, and also the signer can have the option to configure, but I wouldn't want to say it's a requirement just thinking of all of the behind the firewall scenarios and other disconnected environments. Yeah, and I think that there's all, I would also add that it, in some ways it's easier if you can sign, uh, if you can provide the time information, not about every single signature itself, but about some kind of ag aggregate of them, um, you know, within, within, you know, all the things we've talked about about aggregates, but um, because that way, you know, you, you have to access the time server less often and, and, you know, sign less of those things. Yeah, I think the the purpose of having a timestamp server is a lot of signature-based assertions are relative in time. Uh, and so the requirement to have that is fairly clear. Having an external one is en essentially separates out rules uh, between uh, having your root compromise versus sort of like a uh, a public timestamp root compromise. Like it, it, it adds in sort of like a, a second layer of protection, but at the same time, it adds in implications from an availability perspective. So um, we're going to detail out the trade-offs here. Uh, and I think that should help ascertain, you know, uh, whether this is an optional requirement and in that optional requirement, how does it pan out? Um, one of the other things that we also need to discuss here is that with an external timestamp server, um, you're also using uh, another external route um, and whether if it's managed by a registry, whether that's, you know, you use RFC 3161 um, timestamp services that are out there, um, we need to discuss sort of like how those routes uh, um, get managed and distributed. So um, that's, that's, that's what we'd love to cover in this section. And also air gap regions, I think that will also be covered in here. I think for the, as far as the routes, I feel like the you, your one route could delegate to the other, right? So that you have less um, original routes to manage. Does that make sense? So like you could have your um, whatever repository registry route say, this is the time server you should trust for for this. Um, a public, you can also use a public uh, timestamping authority. So there are uh, public T TSAs out there. Um, which is where you can rely on a shared trusted service. Um, that way you enable, um, uh, if your route is compromised, for example, like then, you know, someone can also, uh, uh, will also compromise your timestamping service in that scenario. So having a public timestamp service here, I think has some additional benefits uh, at a certain cost. Okay, yeah, I think we can definitely, you know, list out those trade-offs and figure that out. Yep. Um, any other questions on timestamp servers before I move on? The one thing was the, the interesting thing for me was the whole verify thing. The because we talked a little about some uh, air gap environment scenarios where you you don't actually use the the TSA for verification. You need the cert for it, but you don't need or the public key rather, but you don't need the TSA to verify. So when we think of the air gap environments, they come in different sizes, so to speak. There's, you know, the air gap cloud, which is big and, you know, largely funded and so forth. And, and they may actually even have a TSA, but they may not. The point is, is that where you sign the content, you need a TSA. Where you verify the content, you don't need the TSA. So you can either sign on the public side move it into the air gap environment, still validate that in the air gap environment. If the air gap environment is big enough and complex enough, they need their own TSA to sign, they can set one up. In the smaller TSAs, they're not just air gap, they're literally air blocked, like they're 
walk it around on battery packs and have no internet. So in those cases, they're not building and signing, they're just verifying. So that was the, the line that helped me understand those a little bit better to recognize that the, the TSA, how the TSAs get used for the verification process. Um, so anyway, if, if that helps, I'm not sure if we got that in here or not, but. Uh, it's not in here. I think that's uh, that's a part of what we would discuss in the trade-off section, which we're going to put in next. Uh, is described is describing how uh, what the implications for air gap regions here are. Um, so, if if you're creating an artifact, for example, within an air gap region, you can also potentially create your own timestamp service, and that's using that and using it for validation. So. Um, this really is just kind of calling out that if you have a different route for a timestamp service, what, what, what benefits do you get from it? Uh, and what is the cost of doing that? So we can say, hey, yes, this is, this is a good requirement. It should be mandatory, or this is good in certain cases. It should be optional, um, or you know, the benefits here just make it too complex. Let's not use this at all. So that's, that's, that's what we'd, we'd come up with the recommendation for. I think the, this is part of things we were also talking about last week is some of these things just need some summary definitions that don't go to off to RFCs for the average mortals to try to understand how these things are actually used in some of this. Because that was the thing that the summary of the TSA that I didn't realize that I'm not sure if others are in that same boat. It would help to have like a, a, a summary of these kind of things because then when That's we read through this. Yeah, that's a good call out. I'll look into a link in a summary. I know we did that for like a freeze attack uh, later in the doc. So I think we can call out what RFC 3161 means and uh, what it's useful for. So yeah, um, that's that's a good point. Cool. Can I just ask, is it an explicit goal that if my key is um, revoked at time X, anything I sign before time X remains valid? It's not a, um, I think that becomes a transitive goal um, when we look at like signature rescinding. What does that mean? Uh, and yeah, that's, that's, I, I think that's, that's, that's something that we would want to support if, for example, your signature has a timestamp uh, uh, in it and, 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 and you have that functionality. But yes. Oh, yeah, that would definitely be another aspect of TSA that really I've... made me understand it better. Uh, Sorry, we were. I was trying to bring up that specific question, that instead of having to revoke the key for all ten years or whatever the time is, can it be revoked for since a period of time? And you may not know exactly when the compromise happened, but you know, with all hazardous things like when when doctors do cancer, they always talk about that margin of error. They take a little extra just to make sure. So if you think it was March that you compromised, maybe you include February or you know, whatever date range. But anything before that should be able to consider valid still. So that's that's where the TSA comes in, and that that was helpful for me to understand how that was that TSA played a, an important role in it. I'm thinking through the scenario, I'm wondering if it just makes sense that you revoke the ten year long certificate and then create a one and a half year long certificate to replace it that it has already expired. I think and then that, that become. That becomes more of a implementation as to how we yeah. get there, um, yeah. because signature rescinding and key rescinding have different models, which you would end up with different implementations there, right? So I think this this is more covering that if you have an external timestamp server, all of those time based decisions, um, you add sort of like an additional uh, layer of protection there. Okay, uh, moving on, the next one is um, uh, we're going to discuss signature expiry. So uh, as of right now, the signatures can either expire in one of two ways. One, if you're using a certificate based model if the certificate expires, uh, or if you're going with sort of like a signature allow list or some kind of uh, 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 certification there, it's, it's, it's based on the, the expiry time that's indicated within that certification. Um, so we, we want to look here and determine what the signature expiry time recommendations need to be uh, and whether this is something that should be configurable um, regardless of sort of the the key validity or the certificate validity. Um, this kind of goes into more that if you're going with uh, longer lived signatures, 
uh, you, you may have sort of like a specification on how long that signature should be valid for. Um, so this will kind of, this, this session will talk about the trade-offs there and uh, what sort of recommendations we wanna have. Um, the benefit of this is that uh, it will help protect against uh, freeze attacks. Um, but the, the, main, the main scenario I think we're, we're trying to cover here is that um, this is sort of an assertion that's saying for this, uh, this, this is how long after you've generated a signature uh, you can trust it for uh, before you know, you'll, you'll start kind of saying this is invalid and um, I should treat this artifact the same as an unsigned artifact. I'm looking at this wondering, do we need to really separate the certificate of the signer from the signed content or do we want to merge that into one and say the signed content can never last for longer? than the certificate of the signer. And so we've always got a timestamp on the signed content at that point. Um, the reason we tease it out is if you have, let's say short-lived keys, um, you may not necessarily also want short-lived uh, signatures. Uh, and so um, this is calling out the distinction between a key validity versus a signature validity. So that's, Something that maybe I need to think about some more just because I'm going through the scenarios. Do you really want a signer that has a key that's going to last for a month signing something for three years? Yeah, and I think this this goes into different aspects of it. And I think that's why it's important to kind of call this out, right? So for example, you may want a artifact, artifact signature to be valid for let's say a year. You may want a, um, a signature validity manifest, if you will. So which is like, you know, the uh, update list or a CRL to be signed for a shorter period of time, uh, like a week. And then the key itself might only be valid for a day, right? So that's the scenario you set up. You have short-lived keys because you want to have blast radius controls. And if a key was compromised, how many art other artifacts were signed with it? Um, and so there's different reasons you'd have for having different expiry times. So this one is explicitly going to drive into um, would an optional signature expiry time make sense or should it be mandatory? I think this is more like something we'd want to call it as optional and we'd call it what the behavior of this expiry time would be if that optional field was present. Yeah, I'm just thinking through the attacker scenarios and if an attacker gets a short-lived key, I also want to limit their blast radius. And so I'm just mentally going through the what's the risk here if you allow them to sign something for a longer period of time, that could mean you know, you lose that scenario of being able to give a CI pipeline, a very short-lived key that it can do with a signature and do its stuff with, and you don't have to worry about the CI pipeline doing something else later on. But we add on the risk that they can now potentially sign stuff that you don't even realize is still out there. I think we're trying yeah, to make sure we have the, the right level of flexibility. Go ahead, Melinda. Uh, I think to, to add to what we have said, the, the thought process here was uh, having just short lived keys and the time stamp signature with those two variables, you get to the, in the absence of time stamp, you just have uh, the key expiry to depend on. And in the presence of time stamp signatures, you can use short lived and you have signatures valid till the time stamp, the time stamp signature expires, which may be like 10 years. So the signature expiry gives you another control where customers can explicitly define a period less than the timestamp signature expiry, but isn't really tied to short-lived key expiry. So let me ask this, is there a concept of when I give someone a short-lived key that I can also control the max lifetime of the content they're signing in some way, like a separate expiration? I think that's a that's a good question. Uh, in that you know um, where 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 that expiry time comes from, right? Like you could also you could you can make this a sort of like it's configurable at the time of signing, or this is something that the uh, root has to sign off on. So we know that this is something a policy see that the administrator has globally configured. Um, we'll need to think about what that implication means. I think the trade-off here is for a single route, 
is there a scenario where you would expect multiple expiry times or is a scenario that like, you know, an organization would establish this is a universal policy we'd want for all our artifacts. So uh, that's a good good suggestion. I think we'd, we'd want to clarify um, where that sits. And, and I think there's, there's different trade-offs there to consider. Um, any other uh, comments or questions on signature expiry? Okay. Um, the the next uh, section we're going to cover is the having a mechanism for a transparent root key auto rotation. Um, and so um, roots uh, are, are forming the basis of trust here. Uh, when you're configuring a root into your into your truster, you're saying I've done some out of band validation mechanism to say that I trust this party. Uh, having that root transparently rotated uh, has some implications. Uh, there's both pros and cons for it. So um, we've listed out a couple of scenarios. Uh, one where a public root is compromised. Uh, it's, it's essentially the access to the root key that's been compromised. And what does that implication, what does that mean, pan out? Um, this would enable an attacker to create new uh, uh, new keys uh, within the hierarchy in terms of like a, if a timestamp root or if, uh, if, if a delegate uh, chains up to it, like what, what are the implications of that? Um, and another, other scenarios are sort of like the root is about to be expired and a new root needs to be created and distributed or the way that the current uh, algorithms are, are used, there's a stronger key that can be used. And so moving to a new key uh, where uh, necessarily there hasn't been a, a loss of uh, trust in the original root as much as a, a newer key is more secure or uh, it needs to be created. So there's different scenarios uh, to be considered here. Um, and so we'll spell out sort of what the pros and cons of having this mechanism are so we can have a, a more detailed discussion on whether this should be um, something that uh, should be supported or not supported or be optional. Um, this doesn't necessarily go into key distribution per se, like a root key distribution mechanism. Um, this is really looking more at like, you know, does this automatically update the trust store uh, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, deployer side? Cut off my question before I even got a chance to ask it, which was, you know, the, the biggest challenge with Notary V1 was the tofu. We, we didn't want that trust on first use. And so do we have anything in this document um, or in our overall design of what we're thinking of for how we're going to do that initial distribution? Uh, we have it as a requirement here. Um, I think as we go look, start looking into distribution, um, we'll want to consider if there needs to be a uh, mechanism or not. Like there's a question of who the root owners are and how you're establishing trust, right? Um, I would trust an entity because I have an out of band mechanism where I can go get the root from them, right? So if it's like, you know, I trust uh, Acme, like I know what Acme site is, like they, they're sharing it in some public domain or, you know, through some domain that's, that's, that I can validate belongs to Acme. So a distribution model would rely on saying that I trust, um, like if I'm getting, if I'm, if I'm getting roots from registries, then sure, I trust the registry, give me the root. But otherwise, I, I would, I would, I think you'd want a mechanism that's outside of the scope of Notary to kind of have that root distribution uh, done. So, probably thinking of other equivalents out there, this might be closest to something like the Debian repositories, where you might get a couple roots preloaded in your distribution for Docker Hub or something like that when they give you the Docker desktop install. But otherwise, if you go pull from someone else, you're going to have to know ahead of time to go do an external curl command, pull down the key, and inject that into the notary on your local environment. Correct. Yeah. But I think you're making a good point. We specifically said we don't want, we, we did call out that Tufu is not supported you know, in, our, in our requirements or goals, but we haven't defined what the usability is to actually solve that. Um, uh, that's a good point. And, and I, I do think like the Docker desktop is a good example of something like, hey, they, there is a product that you're trusting. It's associated with a, a trusted registry. You might do that. In the AZ CLI, we might, you know, help with, actually, I'm not sure what search those would be right now that I think about it more because 
it's the customer. So we have to figure out like, maybe there's a way to integrate with Azure Key Vault because that's the Azure CLI, the same thing you would do in AWS, um, that you would configure where do you get your keys from for your registry uh, would be a, a place to do that. Um, the question is, what do you do for the, the public registries? I mean, uh, we do have to figure out the usability story there. It just can't be first one in gets it and then you own it. Uh, any other questions before I move on to the uh, last section that we're adding in? So to go back to actually focusing on what you put in there for the transparent, um, does this then start to imply that we're going to start putting keys and stuff like that up in the registry? And, and I'm trying not to break Steve's neck with you know the shaking. <laughs> I mean, does anybody no. think we should be storing keys in the registry? Because most, like, we keep on talking about this as being the um, one of the risks, and we're trying to say we don't want. Uh, for me, I, I, I'll, I'll just say for me, from running a registry and, and from all the conversation I hear, hear from everybody here, is I don't want to take on the responsibility of keys and, and having things hack hacked. Like, there are products that are specifically designed to secure from that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that there are different kinds of keys too. I think that like the developer signing keys used to actually sign images should definitely never be on the registry because um, otherwise you're not getting really another factor of authentication. You're just getting, you know, to registry again. Um, but I think that if there, are, if there are other like less security intensive ones, maybe. And the root keys themselves, I feel like the keys shouldn't be stored on the registry for sure, but maybe metadata signed by those keys could. And it could even be managed by the same people in some other way. But um, especially for things like root where you need um, a way to distribute that. And maybe the registry is the way to distribute that, but it shouldn't be the, like this key shouldn't actually be stored there. They should be stored offline or in a more secure place. Yeah, I think what I'm looking at is when you have the root key that you already know trusted locally, how does it discover all the other keys that have been signed and approved by that um, intermediates and otherwise. And is that something that goes up to the registry where the registry says, here are all the public keys for these things that we trust in this repo? Or is that something that we have to have well, another out of band process? Or is that part of the actual signature of the artifact itself where all that stuff just gets layered in there? I think if those delegations so, are signed by the root key, right, then you're not actually trusting the registry only any more than as a distribution mechanism. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think. Sorry, I was going to say, no, you, you answered the question. I think we want to tease out what, um, uh, what's actually being distributed, right? So um, the root key should always stay in the possession of the, uh, of the root owner, right? Um, that should never go anywhere else. Um, I think that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty clear cut. The next one, though, like, you know, how the public portion of the root key is distributed that needs to come through a distribution model that you trust. If you are trying to say that we are protecting against registries tampering, how, why, why would you trust a registry to give you uh, the information to validate uh, the entity, right? Um, so I think that, that, that that's, that's, that sort of uh, uh, defeats that purpose. So you need a mechanism that's out of band of the registry um, and the, the goal here, the, the mechanism here has to be something that doesn't necessarily rely on the specification itself um, or, or a centralized service. It's whatever communication mechanism you trust to go talk to that root owner, whether it's a, a website that they own, whether it's through sort of like, you know, you have a contact within that company. I think those mechanisms are out of band, but it has to be a trusted mechanism that you have. Yeah, but if I have gone through and said, okay, I'd now trust Acme Rockets and I've imported that and I've done the out-of-band process there, what I'm looking for is I now need to have the way of saying I trust developer X because Acme Rockets trusted that developer to do the signing of this individual certificate. And so whether that goes into something that is part of the signature itself, that it includes the full chain there, or whether there's some other way I know to trust this key, I'm just kind yeah. of fleshing that out, how that works. 
I, that's that should be a part of the signature mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's uh, uh, you need to necessarily know every key um, hierarchy or, or everything that's been signed. When you're looking at the signature, you want to understand how does this signature chain up to that root, um, and is that hierarchy still valid, right? Like those are the two questions you want to answer, and I think that's part of the uh, the signature spec that we'll we'll, we'll call that out. Well, some additional thoughts there. Uh, like for example, with with public routes uh, and consumption of say third party packages or base layers, um, and if you have multiple environments, you, you you have a repository with different images for different components, and you have multiple environments in which they are deployed. There doesn't seem to be a single set of uh, Publisher signing keys or, or public keys associated with the publisher, not necessarily a root. You say these are the routes that I trust. Uh, these are the publishers that I trust. In different environments, you might want to set up specific rules. And it, it seems to be some parts of these are policies that can be applied to specific services or environments versus a centralized thing that lives in the repository. Hey folks, um, I just noticed the time. Um, I have a hard stop. I, I don't want to squash the meeting. This is good. Um, I just want to acknowledge I have to drop. Yeah, I think we got a lot done. I think we, we can keep continue on this next time we'll keep getting through. Um, I'll call out the, the last scenario. This is really just more look at rescinding signature validity. Um, we are going to split out the allow list and deny list models here that we've looked at and just kind of call up the pros and cons. And so um, uh, we'll schedule more time as we flush out these docs, but those are the five areas that we're looking to cover. Um, if anyone has any comments on the, uh, the section we didn't discuss or um, some of the other sections, feel free to put comments in. Um, we'll look at them when we come back with uh, uh, updates next week on, uh, on or more detailed uh, uh, discussions in these areas. All right. Thanks. Thank you.